Welcome everyone to our event uh, titled The New EU Copyright Exceptions, A Model for the World. This event is co-hosted by Comunia, Wikimedia Deutschland and the project on the right to research on international copyright law. And we have the generous support of Arcadia. Uh, for the next hour and a half, we want to discuss with you and with our panelists, with our distinguished uh, panel, whether uh, the new EU copyright exceptions can solve can can work as a model to solve some of the most pressing issues faced by the research and education communities. Um, as many of you know, Comunia was actively engaged in the legislative process that led to the adoption of the new EU copyright directive, uh, and one of our focus during that time was to improve the situation of education and, uh, and research practitioners uh, by providing uh, these, um, these uh, communities with the right to use copyrighted materials um, to conduct uh, uh, non-commercial activities. So some of you might know that before the, 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 this directive, uh, we had a highly fragmented landscape for education and research. And with this directive, once it is implemented in all member states, we'll have the same rights uh, um, across Europe for education and research. Of course, the directive doesn't solve all the problems faced by the education and research communities, but at least for digital online education uh, that takes place under the responsibility of an educational establishment and for text and data mining activities, we'll now have a, a, an harmonized um, landscape in the region, uh, which provides legal certainty for uh, educators and researchers and also uh, provides a cross-border solution for activities that take place within the EU. And this is certainly something that we celebrate and I dare say that we think that's worth uh, replicating, uh, replicating elsewhere in the world outside of the EU. What do you think, Justus? Yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a very warm welcome also on, on behalf of Wikimedia Deutschland, which uh, is the German chapter of uh, the global Wikimedia movement that promotes Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects. We are certainly very excited to be co-hosting um, this panel with uh, such a you know, distinguished um, panel of experts. Um, Wikimedia, like Comunia, has been very critical of um, the DSM directive when it was negotiated, mostly because of um, the requirement to uh, introduce upload filters, but we don't want to talk about that today. We want to um, discuss uh, what we think is actually an, an excellent introduction uh, to the limitation exceptions for um, educational and research users in the digital environment. And I think everybody here um, on the panel, but certainly also in the audience, has witnessed um, the shift to the digital environment over the past two years um, with the pandemic. So I think it's also a most timely issue um, to be discussed. And uh, with that being said, uh, I think, um, Teresa, um, please, please go ahead. I, I think we have one minor technical issue, which we, which we are hopeful to resolve. Um, one of our speakers has difficulties to connect, but, but hopefully we'll be able to manage that um, over the next uh, couple of minutes. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yusuf. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to introduce our, our panelists now. Um, so if they can join me uh, on the scene, that would be wonderful. So probably we're still having some technical issues. So I'll start, I'll start introducing them. Um, so we have um, with us today uh, to start uh, Marco Giorello. He has been the head of the of units for copyright uh, in the European Commission at the DJ Connect since 2017. Um, Marco is a lawyer by training. Uh, he has worked with the European Commission for more than 20 years covering numerous, numerous areas of the European internal market policy. And since 2011, he has been working in copyright issues. So he was directly involved in the planning and negotiations of the copyright reform, including the directive uh, that we will be discussing today, the directive on copyright in the digital single market. Um, 
Uh, our next uh, speaker will be Catherine Styler. She has been an international champion for openness as a legislator and as a practitioner for over 20 years. She was a member of the European Parliament for Scotland from 1999 to 2019. So she, uh, she was there on the two main EU copyright reforms and she served as a vice chair of the European Parliament's Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee. Um, so since, 2000, uh, since uh, 2020, Catherine is, is, has been the Chief Executive Officer of Creative Commons. Uh, much more could be said of her, but our time is limited. So I'll uh, introduce you our, um, our third speaker, uh, will be Ari Prasetio. Ari is a diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, he is in charge of intellectual property and trade dispute settlement issues. Uh, his portfolio on IP covers all international norm setting activities within WIPO, as well as other IP related issues in Indonesia, ranging from bilateral and regional negotiation for IP chapters in FTA agreements to other programs and projects on IP in Indonesia. Eri used to serve in the permanent mission of the Republic of Indonesia in Geneva, that's where we met him, covering all the IP issues from 2016 and to 2020. Uh, so, last but not least, and I'm very happy to see you here, Ruth, uh, after the technical issues, Professor Ruth Tukenichi, uh, as many of you know, is the Jeremiah, Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of uh, the Harvard Universities, um, Universities Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Uh, she teaches IP law among other sub subjects and their research and scholarship examines uh, innovation, policy, economic development, human rights and global knowledge governance. Um, in addition to being a, a pro prolific academic professor, Okadichi advises governments on a variety of issues at the intersection of IP and trade law. And she has served as a lead expert and negotiator for the WIPO Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works, which uh, many of you know is, is the, one of the, um, the biggest achievements uh, um, in, in terms of uh, harmonizing users' rights at an international level. Professor Kadichi has been named one of the 50 most uh, influential figures in IP by managing IP and has been awarded uh, uh, many awards and, and it's really a pleasure uh, and an honor to have her with us today. So this being said, uh, I'll ask our speakers uh, to, to start by making some in introductory remarks. And, and, and first of all, I would ask Marco to, to start because of course he was engaged from the commission on the proposal that, that led to the, to the adoption of this directive. And he can tell us a bit about uh, a summary version of, of what, what are these mandatory exceptions for education and what, was, what were the reasons uh, behind the commission's uh, position and, and proposal to harmonize uh, these rules at the EU level. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Teresa, uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. First of all, Teresa used to say, I would like to congratulate you for uh, having uh, proposed uh, a seminar uh, specifically on uh, these subjects, uh, because uh, indeed uh, we have uh, often discussed uh, other parts of the Copyright Directive, uh, but maybe not so much uh, uh, the exceptions, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, the teaching exception, I must say, is probably one of the most uh, underrated topics uh, in the in the copyright reform so i'm very happy actually to get back to these issues and to have the chance to discuss it with you uh, today uh, as you said i have been uh, involved in this uh, long story since the very beginning the commission proposal for a new directive on copyright dates from 2016 the directive, as you know, was eventually adopted in 2019, but the preparatory work started much earlier and really at the beginning of the 10 decades, basically. 
Uh, and I must say that uh, uh, research and education have been uh, really, since the beginning, uh, at the forefront of uh, our discussions uh, on uh, what then became the copyright modernization reform. It is really one of the first subjects actually that emerged in the discussions uh, and in the preparatory works of the Commission. And uh, what is the reason? The reason, uh, you, you have already mentioned it to some extent, uh, is that uh, uh, the 2001 directive, which was the most important directive regulating copyright in the European Union before uh, the copyright reform, already had two provisions, two exceptions on uh, illustration for teaching and research, respectively. But uh, these exceptions uh, were uh, drafted in a very general and unqualified manner in the 2001 directive. They were optional for member states to implement, and overall they were not specifically targeted to internet uses. So the analysis that the Commission carried out in the preparation first for the impact assessment and then for the Commission proposed directive was an analysis leading to the conclusion that the situation was indeed quite diverse across member states. It's true that most, although not all member states, had implemented these optional exceptions, but they had done it in a very different way. And in a number of cases, these exceptions were clearly not applicable to digital uses and to the online environment. So we needed to intervene on this matter. The uh, Commission proposal contained uh, two specific provisions uh, on uh, uh, text and data mining uh, for the purposes of scientific research uh, and uh, on illustration for teaching. Uh, at the end of three years of negotiation, uh, the provisions became three because a second text and data mining uh, exception uh, was added uh, to cover uh, a broad range uh, of uh, uses. Now, I will not have the time, of course, uh, to go very much into, into the details actually of these provisions, uh, but I think it is important important uh, basically to notice uh, that uh, uh, Article 3, which is uh, you know, the uh, exception for text and data mining for scientific research, uh, is uh, uh, a provision which uh, basically covers uh, uh, exceptions to the reproduction right for uh, uh, text and data mining in all cases where research organizations and cultural heritage organizations have lawful access to the content that they wish to mine. Uh, this exception is also complemented by a horizontal provision, which is actually valid to all exceptions uh, in the new directive, which is in Article 6, uh, which, uh, among other things, uh, lays down a principle of prohibition of uh, contractual override uh, for the uses which are covered by exceptions. In essence, this means, uh, for the purposes of uh, scientific research, uh, that I believe the directive has uh, uh, you know, implemented what uh, sometimes in the preparation for uh, the copyright reform uh, was referred to as uh, the right to read is the right to mine, at least for uh, scientific and research organizations. So it is uh, really clear that uh, for content to which these organizations have lawful access, uh, they are uh, able actually to carry out text and data mining uh, without the need for uh, a license or a right holder authorization. The exception uh, for uh, illustration for teaching, the modernized exception lie down uh, in, in Article 5, uh, is actually part of uh, a more complex mechanism of uh, complementarity between uh, exceptions and licenses. And this is a mechanism which, which was uh, already pretty much proposed uh, uh, by the Commission uh, in the original Commission proposal and has not been altered very much uh, during the negotiation. In essence, member states are now required to lay down a specific exception uh, applicable to educational establishments, uh, both in the physical and online environment. But member states are also allowed to uh, implement these rules in such a way that uh, licenses take precedence over the exceptions when they cover the same uses. So the directive, I think, talks about suitable licenses, which is, uh, of course, uh, a term which will need to be applied uh, in practice. Uh, what is uh, uh, very interesting to note uh, in Article 5 uh, is uh, uh, the provision which introduces a sort of uh, 
internal market uh, specific mechanism, uh, it's a sort of a legal fiction which uh, applies to online educational uses uh, carried out by educational establishment and uh, that makes sure that the uh, copyright relevant act carried out by uh, educational establishment are always uh, deemed to uh, be uh, carried out uh, in the country of uh, the school, uh, university or, or the educational establishment itself. Uh, it's a bit complicated to explain into words, but basically this uh, is a mechanism which is there to make sure that uh, education at a distance uh, works uh, in practice uh, in the same way across the entire Europe. So in essence, if uh, a school or a university in France gives access to uh, some educational material to students which are physically located in uh, Germany or in Italy, uh, the directives make sure that uh, the copyright relevant rules are the French rules in this case uh, and that uh, there is no risk basically of fragmentation uh, or uh, no risk that uh, the country where the student is uh, may claim that the different rules uh, are applicable. So this is a bit complex as I said but it is a rather uh, interesting uh, mechanism which actually uh, you know as I said uh, aims at dealing with uh, the specificity of the internal market and basically you know solving uh, territoriality issues within the European internal market and uh, it is not the first time, actually, that we have done it uh, in the context of uh, uh, exceptions uh, in European law. And uh, uh, I think the, the precedent, actually, which inspired us for this specific internal market mechanism uh, has to be found, uh, first of all, in the Orphan Works Directive from 2012, which, is a, which has a very similar mechanism, but also to some extent uh, in the directive implementing the Marrakesh Treaty within the internal market, uh, which also has a mechanism uh, basically to make sure that uh, cross-border access uh, uh, work uh, in practice. Now, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, these provisions uh, have not been the subject of uh, a lot of discussions in the last years. Uh, once uh, the copyright directive has been adopted, uh, the ball, if I may call it like that, uh, has been thrown into the camp of the member states. Uh, the national implementation processes uh, have been advancing uh, overall quite slowly on, on the entire directive. And uh, so far, uh, we've had only a dozen member states uh, who have uh, implemented uh, the directive. They are late, all the others, because the implementation deadline was June 2021. And that's the reason why the Commission has currently opened a number of infringement procedures, which may in principle lead to referring member states which will still not have adopted the directive before the Court of Justice for infringements of, of European law. But we are not there yet, but I wanted to mention this just as a, you know, a demonstration of the fact that even if these subjects are not very much discussed at the moment, they remain very important and the implementation of these rules is a priority. Uh, one last word for now to say that for what we have seen so far of the national laws that have been adopted, most member states have implemented the text and data mining and the teaching exception in a way which is rather uh, close, it's, it's basically sort of cut and paste, if I may call it like that, of, uh, uh, of the European directive, which means that the practical application of these rules uh, will be the proof, the test, basically, uh, to see whether uh, the system works in practice. And uh, in this respect, uh, and I conclude with that, uh, I think that there are uh, at least uh, two issues uh, that uh, will have to be monitored uh, very closely to see how these uh, new rules uh, are applied in practice over the coming months and years. For text and data mining is uh, the mechanism of uh, reservation of rights, which uh, does not apply in the area of scientific research, but applies uh, to the more general uh, text and data mining exception. And uh, for teaching, uh, I already referred to it, uh, is uh, to see how the complementarity between uh, exceptions and licenses will work in practice, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, how uh, educational establishment will be able to determine uh, 
whether licenses are available in the market and whether these licenses are suitable to their needs, which is, according to Article 5, the condition for licenses to have a precedence over exceptions. So, as I said, it's a rather complex regime, but that uh, tries really to take into account the specificity of the internet environment, the specificity of the European single market, uh, and also to do so with a certain level of pragmatism, uh, if I may say so, uh, to keep together uh, uh, licenses and exceptions uh, depending on uh, the specific situation uh, that are at stake uh, in the different member states. Uh, I think I will conclude uh, for now, but uh, of course uh, uh, I would be very happy to contribute to the discussion uh, later on uh, in the panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really important for people to understand um, our model in terms of uh, the EU model, in terms of uh, the flexibility that is given to, to, to member states to, to adjust um, to, to their specificities, especially in the, in the context of education that has always been uh, one, one of the arguments used is that uh, education is... Uh, is country specific and, and, and of course the situations are and the circumstances in each country are different even within the EU and, and, and that flexibility exists in the, in the, in the new uh, EU prototypes. Um, I, I, well, I, I've been monitoring the, the, um, the implementation myself uh, and while, uh, um, while, while you say that uh, um, many countries have been uh, implementing it in a way that's very close to the to the to the prototypes, I recall that so some some of the flexibilities were around remuneration, so countries could decide if they could they would remunerate the users or not, and, and in that in that field things have been very different. So countries that normally didn't didn't compensate for these uses are more or less keeping the same tradition, and the new education exception is not subject to remuneration. I think that's an interesting uh, um, thing to see. Uh, the other is licenses, as you mentioned. Countries have the option of of, uh, of implementing the exception with with this with this license override or complementary. Uh, but that was an option, and I, I which we at Comunia were always uh, very concerned uh, about. And 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 of course, it's still soon to see how many countries will implement that that exception or that sorry that option. But it's it's not everywhere. So that complementary uh, or that. Uh, um, that way of uh, switching off the exceptions when the licenses exist, it's it's not been implemented with all the with all the countries. Which for us, um, I, I I dare say that's a positive thing because we also uh, believe that uh, that certain uses should not be uh, overridden by 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 licenses. Where where others could of course and 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 should because they're not covered by by exceptions and could not be but uh, but i think uh, just also listening uh, to you and hearing a bit about the the reasoning behind modernizing adapting to the internet and, and uh, adapting it to the to the internal market i think that's also a very good thought to to our conversation later on so i'll now um uh, end over to Katrin. Katrin uh, uh, was one of the MEPs that uh, that was there in the parliament and the parliamentary discussions that led to the adoption of the directive. And she, and 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 I'm, if I may say, she was one of the MPPs that was always ready to listen to the civil society and was genuine, genuinely concerned with the problems faced by users. Um, and and it, from my perspective, she was for sure one of the MEPs that actively worked towards improving the provisions of the copyright directive, uh, and we are very thankful for that still. Um, so I would like to to hear from for, from Catherine a bit of her thoughts. Uh, and she, since she was there, she also saw the other side of the of the EU lawmaking process uh, when discussing this directive. So uh, thank you, Catherine. The floor is yours. Thanks, Teresa. And I think I think we might slide, uh, share some slides as well. So we'll we'll see if that that works out. But you know, huge thank you um, to Teresa and 
Comenia for putting on this event and Wikimedia Deutschland and providing me with the opportunity to reflect on my past experience whilst in the European Parliament with the Copyright Directive and Reform, whilst also considering the role that Creative Commons plays currently and in the future in this space. And, you know, Comenia continues to play such an important and trusted role in helping policymakers in Brussels make sense of the complex world of copyright. And, you know, Teresa, I really remember my office welcoming your briefings and I certainly benefited from your thoughtfulness, academic rigour and the wisdom that the briefings brought. I think it was the community's ability to distill the complex into what matters for the public interest is just so important. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you. But back to the, the, the subject at hand, which is our talk today on exceptions and limitations. And as Marco's already described, there are great benefits to the EU in the harmonised exceptions for education and research. Before, there was a mismatch of national rules, often contradictory, leading to legal uncertainty, many created for a very different world where digital was not central to the reality we exist in today. And often, they were in conflict with other national and EU priorities, such as the Horizon Research Programme and the EU's ambition for innovation, particularly for startups. And I say this because when we were dealing with the copyright reform, and I say just eight years ago because it was 20, um, 20, uh, 2014 that I began getting involved. And as Marco said, it was 2016 when, when, um, when things really kicked off. But it was 2014 when we started really looking at things eight, eight years ago. I mean, just think, eight years ago, the digital world was so very different to today of 2022. And so, for example, there was little consideration when we were talking in 2014 of AI in the context of the copyright discussion. And blockchain was being debated more by those involved with the Econ Committee than those of us involved in copyright reform. And I just it's, it's, it's just an interesting observation and a reflection. Therefore, how do we create lasting rules which can help the objectives of the EU in removing barriers to cross-border cooperation just remains a constant challenge, particularly in the relatively new digital environment, which is constantly changing. But what the EU can teach us is so helpful when we're thinking about cross-border barriers globally. And this is where I think what we achieved at an EU level is so important as we consider today where we're going globally. Creating exceptions and limitations which can be supportive of future challenges is hard. But what we reached in the EU was a compromise. And with any consensus, decision-making process was an improvement in what had gone on before. Education and research were two areas where, in a very challenging policy space, was where civil society and uh, the policy space where civil society interests were quite difficult sometimes to be heard. We could actually see a glimmer of compromise and consensus developing spectrum. So let me take the areas of TDM, educational establishments and cross-border ambitions. And TDM, there were many of us who wanted to reach consensus for more on the commercial side as well as the non-commercial purposes. And this was not supported by some of the larger political groups or the majority of member states. And we had to compromise. And that's the exception for TDM for non-commercial purposes, something which was interesting because having been um, a, an MEP for, for Scotland and the UK, the UK was very quick to say about its own um, TDM exceptions, which had been passed many a few years previously, um, and using that as a, as, a, as a role model. However, you know, what we have is an improvement on what went before, provided some certainty for researchers and could be understood. Another exception regime for commercial purposes was introduced, but with such a convoluted opt-out opt -out mechanism, it's now hard to imagine how this will actually work in practice. Creative Commons actually released a statement recently that demonstrates the con concrete challenges that arise when we build complex exception mechanisms from which right holders can opt out. And so this is something that we're constantly learning about. On educational establishments, again, there was a compromise that provided certainty for traditional educational establishments, where up to this point there'd be none. I think it's important to remember that education, and Theresa's touched upon this, and I think it's just, again, to reiterate that, it's a tricky area of EU competence because it's not an area 
of, uh, of, of actually EU competence, because that is a member state competence in terms of uh, general education. However, the growing EU research space, supported by member states and with a billion euro budget to reflect its importance, has led to the complexity of cross-border cooperations with national rules, creating barriers to the very research which required to propel the EU's economic and digital ambitions. The carve-out um, has allowed for legal certainty without effect national competence and sovereignty. And we know this does not uh, include those informal settings where so much of lifelong learning takes place, and we should be more ambitious in the future. On cross-border ease, the exceptions allow for cross-border cooperation within a legal framework, and, and uh, Theresa and Mark have discussed that. This is, has to be recognised as a very good thing and something that was achieved. But we're here today to think about what the EU can teach the world in this space. And, you know, firstly, the exception model in a highly complex legal world provided legal certainty and a solution to a tricky problem. Yet how could this apply globally? Firstly, you'd require consensus around education and research, even as simple as a global definition. And from there, take this to what is possible to create. The EU's exception applies to the EU. But we all recognise that we're in a global research space. So if this pandemic has taught us anything, then it's that cross-border cooperation and research is not just in scientists and researchers' interests, it's in humanity's interests. I mean, I was talking to Teresa last week um, and Portugal last week was under, I don't know if it, is, it still is today, Teresa, but we talked last week about how Portugal was under a heat wave in February, potentially affecting crops and the food supply. Where I now am um, based in California, the temperature last week was 20 degrees Celsius above, above what it normally is for February. And just yesterday, the New York Times reported a story that fueled by climate change, the drought in the American Southwest has resulted in the region's driest two decades in 1,200 years. If ever there was a case to be made for cross-border exemption for climate research at a global level, it really is now. And perhaps this is the time to make such a case using the climate emergency as a way to bring forward some of the things we are looking for globally in terms of research. And yet, as, as my director of Open Knowledge pointed out, um, that you know CC licences are cross-border and provide an elegant solution to some of these problems. And CC licences do not have a problem cross-border. When a work is CC licensed, it can be used for any purpose, by anyone, in any setting, as long as the licensee user is in compliance with the terms of the licence. So the power of CC licence is there. And to conclude, there's much to learn from the EU model, and much to reflect on how we can have a fit-for-purpose copyright regime globally to help educators and researchers alike. I'm proud that Creative Commons can help with legal sharing online and I look forward to seeing how we can better share to solve the pressing problems of our world today. We all know that the internet has transformed the way creative content and information is produced, distributed and accessed. And when the European Parliament approved the Directive on Copyright, Many of you know I was greatly disappointed it was approved with the problematic provisions of Article 15 and 17, which is a disturbing path towards control of the web to benefit only powerful rights holders at the expense of the rights of users and the public interest. However, there were positives that came out of the directive to improve the commons, libraries and cultural heritage, education and research sectors. For example, Article 14, the directive includes a provision to ensure that digital reproductions of the public domain works don't get a separate copyright and also be in the public domain. In Article 6, there's text to improve the ability for cultural heritage institutions to preserve works and to make available copyrighted works from their collections that are no longer commercially available. And in Article 3, the directive slightly improves the copyright exemption in text and data mining by making mandatory an earlier optional provision that would expand the possibilities for those wishing to conduct text and data mining. There were several mandatory exceptions and limitations aimed at supporting museums and facilitating the digitisation and online sharing of cultural heritage. For example, Article 6 provides an exception for the preservation of cultural heritage. Internationally, though, there's currently no clear international framework providing for mandatory exceptions and limitations for the benefits of museums. That means that countries are not obligated to have museum-friendly exceptions and limitations in their national copyright law, and many indeed don't.
By seeing the positive outcome of exceptions and limitations supporting cultural heritage institutions, there's an opportunity to make these part of international law or at least harmonise them with the laws of other countries. I hope that the EU can lead as an example of the possible and I look forward to sharing the learning from what was constructively achieved in the recent copyright reform. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It was um, it was uh, really insightful to uh, to hear about that time when when we were still happy and unhappy with with so many things in the directive. And, and and as I said in the beginning, we are definitely don't feel this is a complete solution for for everything. Um, and, and and there are still things that could be done. Uh, uh, at EU level, even uh, so, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. I hope that uh, that we can still go back to to those discussions in in some years. Um, also, uh, thank you for for recalling us that there's many other things that are positive in the directive, namely in the space of cultural heritage institutions. We don't have time today to to go through uh, through through those. So. That's why we are focusing on education and research, but, but there is indeed other models that serve other communities, and 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 the EU could could there also be uh, looked at um, to 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 take lessons um, to other countries. So, uh, with that being said, I will uh, uh, now. Uh, and over to Harry. Uh, as I said, we met Harry uh, in Geneva. He has been one of the most vocal uh, delegates on the issues of users' rights, uh, bringing the perspective from the global south, uh, um, calling for for WIPO um, to engage in discussions that could. Uh, Follow the model of the Marrakesh Treaty, but all other models. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter at this point. We just we just wanted the the the, the conversations to move forward. And Ari has been one of those uh, one of those delegates that uh, has been indeed supporting that uh, that same call of of moving things forward because. Um, I believe uh, that uh, uh, that is true to to say that. He's in, in, he shares the position that uh, we should take care of uh, exceptions and limitations the same way we take care of exclusive rights. So we need uh, balance in, in the system or in the international system. Um, at, at least that's what he's been uh, uh, what he's been voicing and 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 definitely has been uh, one of the most relevant voices in those discussions at the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. So I'm, I'm very happy that he, he accepted our invitation to be here today. And hopefully, Eri, uh, you will be uh, OK with your technical connections, with your internet connection, and you'll be able to, to stand with us and, and talk for, for a, brief, uh, a brief moment with us your initial thoughts on these issues. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, I hope everyone hear me. Okay. Um, thank you. First off, uh, I'm sorry. I will have to uh, turn off my camera, and I hope my voice are not echoing. Uh, can anyone from Comunia confirm that? Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the contribution. So I will uh, I will just go off. At the, so apologies because in Indonesia we we have to use VPN for female. So this the streaming is a bit up and down. Uh, whenever I I see that my my bandwidth is a bit low, I will try to slow down and then please uh, bear with me. So first off, I would like to thank Comunia and Wikimedia for the invitation. Considering not only the organizers but also the list of the other panelists, it is very much a great honor for me to be here. With that, allow me to lay down some disclaimers. Uh, not an expert or technical, copyright. my background is political science and economic and policy. But I've been a diplomat and education for a couple of years, and my on a general policy level perspective. So apologies in advance if in my 
comments that may come across as boring or just repeating the same politics that you are already familiar with. Uh, I think harm for us to have a constant reminder on a policy level debate from the including copyright. Disclaimer, my perspective from the Indonesian experience intellectual property cannot be and politically important than they are today. You know, the governments all over the world have been citing the term uh, economy. And of course, countries like the EU or, or the countries have realized this way in developing countries, while emerging economies like Indonesia are starting to build more and more attention and creativity just recently to avoid the so-called So, this based economy that is no doubt that IP, including copyright, is indispensable uh, to policy making in all areas of economy. So, this frames my comments today. At least for us in Indonesia, it asks the question how can we use tools to affect our economic and development strategy? And then what are the difficulties uh, countries like Indonesia face in the current global IP region? There are some imbalances that need to be corrected. There is also the question on the capacity of countries to formulate their negotiations and become well informed. Both for this system. So this is the essential question that policy makers, including myself, try to in order to design IP laws policies that best meet its as well as to the global IP stakeholders. Uh, so for us, policy practitioners in foreign affairs, the key word is public interest. And I think this also applies for, 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 for those who are working in the IP technical levels. Uh, I will twin of public interest, right? It's a I'm sure the dish, uh, that the condition we, we actually all agree here in this in this room that the grant of exclusive rights over creative endeavor or intellectual enterprise is principally promoting the public interest. So every country in the world recognizes this important goal of promoting public interest and IP uh, system include uh, the copyright. So uh, this public interest principle is also clearly articulated in major international treaties and of course as you mentioned one it is there in the preeminent TRIPS agreement that I'm, I'm sure a lot of countries are using TRIPS agreement as their gateway in this modern day to devise their IP laws. And here I would like to, to explain more on, on this concept of unidentical twins of the concept of public interest within the IP system including the copyright system. One is based on the notion that the state or the government is obligated to make output of nation or wealth nation through values created by products, and in this case, creative and intellectual and first. So this brings us to the reason that the public interest of IP is actually to secure optimal op of value addition by granting exclusive rights to authors, creators, and inventors. But there are other concepts of public interest, which consist of mechanism to ensure that the public has optimal access to the rich store of knowledge products. So state and government also have the obligation to facilitate the dissemination of knowledge, those generating social welfare gains, and for the benefit of creators who rely on the availability of a robust public domain from which to draw resources for productive ends. So this is where my perspective at. 
which is the endeavor to ensure a copyright system that reasonably accommodate the two aspects of the public interest in order to promote progress and encourage growth. However, this, this concept of public interest in the global IP systems, and I'm talking not, not really on, 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 on the, like Indonesian copyright law or EU, EU copyright law, but international IP regulation is focusing disproportionately on just one aspect of the public interest, namely harmonization on the granting of exclusive rights and its enforcement. Uh, so we, if we take a look at some recent updates on international copyright regime, barring the Marrakesh Treaty mutual case, provision on copyright exceptions and limitations in TRIPS, WC, UPPT are relatively unchanged to the one while in the other hand, these new updates in copyright regime have released Okay, I'm so sorry uh, because of this internet uh, problem connection. So I will. Uh, what, what, what I was just discussing earlier, there is an imbalance in the global IP system right now. While we are updating TRIP, PPT, we, we update, you know, we update the exclusive run, but we, we never really update the exceptions and limitations in the global IP system. These exceptions relatively remain unchanged. Uh, to the Bern Convention as compared to provisions relating to uh, granting of exclusive rights and new modes of protection and enforcement. So these, these are the imbalances there. You know, uh, uh, if, if you take a look at the experience in the city, the WPT is, is really there, an omnibus provision, but leave uh, governments to in trying to divide uh, their own uh, and limitations. So, and then uh, uh, apart from trips, we, we see bilateral negotiations like like F or, or economic partnership agreement by industrialist countries and developing countries. Well, uh, here the substantive protection of, of granting exclusive rights are being upgraded and codified. But then if you take a look at most FTAs and, and, and comprehensive economic agreements and limitations provisions are, are remain, they're just causing a certainty in regard to we upgrade the public interest to incentives for creation, but we never upgrade of public interest, which is to ensure access uh, to to knowledge and, and creation. So, if I can share right now, there are three new that represent our the new copyright era, which is a focus the focus on copyright owners and authors and the substitution of law with technology as a means of controlling access, and then the privilege of private of social uh, welfare gains. This is this is how it, uh, exceptions and limitations are very important. Uh, so before going on on how we can balance these imbalances, allow me to sidetrack a bit here. Uh, so uh, just to answer some questions that, that, that maybe some of us are having. So uh, if the provision are not on ENL are not really updated since burn, and then countries are left to devise their own ENL. Then why don't developing countries uh, devise their own domestic ENL that cater to their own economic needs? You know, just like what the EU has done with their EU direct, with their EU copyright, EU, EU copyright directive. The answer goes back to political and economic reality, and to save time, I will just mention two uh, main reasons on why we cannot just. Developing countries, we cannot just devise ENL as easy as that. Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, cap the capabilities to understand the technical realities of devising uh, exceptions and limitations that are really updated 
with the new realities are not that easy and, and for some developing countries we, we just don't have this these resources and then another aspect another reason why this, this is not as easy as it sounds is because there are political and economic influence usually from other countries from third countries uh, on the development of copyright law in developing countries for example we see there are unilateral ip monitoring system like like the report on the protection and enforcement of IP rights in third country uh, that are published by the European Commission. Uh, so this, 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 this makes it a bit trickier for us to actually try to, to devise an ENL provision that, 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 that can really work to our realities. I'm sure uh, I don't have to, to go on detail with regard to the fact that if one developing country tries to have an uh, an, an omnibus provision of, on exceptions and limitations, we see that there are other countries or third countries that are with, with, that, with the new, uh, uh, you know, uh, omnibus uh, kind of exceptions and limitations provision within the, the, the new law. I, I will not mention the, the name of the country. So, how do we craft the balance between these two public interest concepts? First, we need to balance rights with exceptions and limitations and i will not go into detail with this i'm sure most of us understand how what, what, what are the, the the friction between between rights and exceptions and limitations second it's we need to balance owners with users because uh, we it is with with our reality that now uh, in the digital answers and Users can be creators, can be users, and up and and go to the the, the range. What, what what we're trying to do. First, uh, let's take a look at what at what we have or what we do not have at the moment. First, in the international level, we we do not have an omnibus provision. Yes, or all general uh, general uh, level, and second. In the international level, there is no great form or to a great interpretation of the step test. But we have it at the international level efforts to establish minimum limitation and exceptions, which is the closest to what we're doing in WIPO. Although in the past decade, we have to agree on Marrakesh Treaty, uh, while agreements on other elements are still a bit far uh, within reach. And maybe because I only have left, I just want to say one thing that uh, another thing that is very important for us is that there is the pertinent need from the presumption that limitations and exceptions is merely weaken the copyright system rather than strengthen its capacity to promote interest both from the authors and on site as well as for the users. Again, because in this day and age, authors are also users and users are also all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sherry, and and uh, and thank you for standing beside, uh, despite the, the technical difficulties. I think we could we could hear the most important parts of your speech um, uh, about the, the the different modalities for developing solutions at international level, about the difficulties faced by uh, developing countries, and all the the, the important. Uh, rationale behind beyond uh, beyond, uh, beyond copyright laws and copyright exceptions. So, let me move uh, 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 very quickly to Professor Ruto uh, She she has been she has done uh, an impressive work uh, uh, and 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 has published uh, way too many too many too many things to to mention here on the on copyright uh, exceptions and. And discussing widely the role of multilateralism in providing a solution for access to knowledge. So, uh, uh, very happy to to hand over very quickly to uh, to Professor uh, Ruth to to give us uh, uh, some brief insights on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Um, I am delighted to be a part of this panel and um, want to thank. Uh, the organizers, Communia, Teresa, 
um, all of my co-panelists for really insightful remarks and for the um, work, um, particularly of the European Commission. Um, I think that what we are discussing today reflects um, both courage and principle, but also a return to what copyright law is for. So I'm gonna make some brief remarks. We are going to have a robust panel discussion and, and I hope that some of the other comments that I would have made will come out in the course of that discussion. To give us a sense of context, I think it's important to keep in mind that the new regime in, in Europe um, really takes us back to alignment with what copyright law was first envisioned to do. It is not a surprise at all to most copyright scholars, to policymakers, that from its very inception, copyright was focused um, on education. The very first uh, formal Copyright Act, the Statute of Anne, was very explicit about its educational focus. In the United States, uh, many state copyright laws prior to the enactment of a federal copyright statute emphasized education as the focus um, and the um, objective of a copyright system. And so I, I think that part of what we're discussing today is an effort to try to reorient the global copyright system to come back to those roots. And what are the kinds of designs, what are the kinds of mechanisms that will be required for us to really begin to see a more nurturing copyright system globally? Let me remind us of a few points that are worth keeping in mind. First of all, there's a tendency when we look at the new European regime to, to think about limitations and exceptions as the primary or principal tool to facilitating um, user access and to encouraging accessibility of materials for educational purposes. But I want to suggest particularly for policymakers that we keep in mind the possibility of limitations on copyrightable subject matter. One of the reasons there is such pressure on limitations and exceptions is because the capacious nature of copyrightable subject matter means that we're constantly having to claw back. And the only means to claw back is limitations and exceptions. And as I believe some of my co-panelists have already mentioned, the political economy of trying to take back the scope of copyrightability through limitations and exceptions is often quite costly. And so one thing policymakers can keep in mind is to maintain the boundaries around copyrightable subject matter. For example, we need text and data mining today um, as an exception in order to facilitate research. But perhaps one might ask the question, what is it about the scope of copyrightable subject matter that led us to a situation in which we needed to begin to claw back text and data mining. Um, second is of course limits on duration. As we all know, our current duration limits are extraordinarily long. The fact of the matter is that we are always generating new knowledge. Does it make sense to protect copyright for as long as we do today? If we had shorter terms and more appropriate scope of copyrightable subject matter, it is possible that we would put less pressure on the need um, for limitations um, and um, exceptions. There is, of course, also the possibility of imposing limitations on the conditions of protection. Um, it is the case that um, there are still many countries around the world that require particular modalities, um, either to file a lawsuit, for example, in the United States through registration or fixation, um, as we see uh, required to different degrees around the world. Um, but there are ways in which we might think about the conditions um, of protection and ways in which we can better align those conditions to make access and usability of material more feasible. Second big, big point that I want to make uh, this morning, uh, at least morning in the United States, um, is to think about 
the structure of limitations and exceptions under the Berne Convention, and of course now somewhat complicated by the TRIPS Agreement. But the basic structure, as I uh, discuss at length in my paper um, from back at the early 2000s, is that we have essentially four kinds of limitations and exceptions. And the new European regime, very interestingly, uh, picks up on all four of these modalities um, in a very different way, but nonetheless, it's reflected. And I think this speaks to the resilience of the, re of the design that the Berne Convention um, reflects. First, we have, of course, uncompensated limitations. Um, and we see that the educational exception um, in the DSM is an uncompensated, for the most part, an uncompensated limitation and exception, which is really important in the overall balance of the copyright scheme. Then, of course, we have compensated limitations and exceptions, and particularly in the context of commercial use, we see this being echoed um, in um, the new European um, system. Then we have something in the Berne Convention that I refer to as a special compensated use regime. We see this a little bit um, in the burn appendix. This is essentially where you have a liability rule. You, you must allow use by users, but there is a settled royalty scheme um, negotiated ahead of time um, that allows the owner of the work to receive compensation. So this is sort of a, a you might call it a compulsory license, but I think it's really a special compensated use regime. And then, of course, in the burn appendix, we also saw through um, the uh, appendix something called the bulk access, um, which is really dedicated to developing countries and dedicated to the back in the print and analog age, the importance of having bulk access um, for educational purposes. This was a big issue um, in the 1960s, and we saw this resolved through the Berne Appendix. The text and data mining exception, funnily enough, is very similar in its architecture to this idea of bulk access, because the text and data mining exception we are seeing is the most popular um, and the most um, wide ranging in terms of its its unconstrained boundaries for users to be able to, to get into the text and data mining, particularly for research um, purposes. So when you think about these four types, this topology of limitations and exceptions, you can see to various degrees that the European um, uh, regime really picks up on these four. Now, one question that we should ask and that I think will come up in the context of our uh, discussions um, in the, during the panel is what are these limitations and exceptions designed to do? Let me suggest at least three things that we need to keep in mind as we contemplate implementation and as we contemplate the possibility that the EU has now provided us with a model to advance the discourse and to prepare us for what education will look like um, in the future. First, let me suggest a number of things. First of all, the classroom of the future we have now seen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be an increasingly digitized classroom. And there is a tendency to conflate access to information, such as text and data mining, with access to knowledge and access to education. And let me suggest that we want to be careful. These are not the same things. Access to education or to educational materials or to materials for educational purposes requires a capacity to use the materials in ways that are dynamic, in ways that are unprecedented, and in ways that try to keep up with what educational needs are to be. So that suggests that limitations and exceptions that are discrete, that are explicit, while they provide certainty, may not always be dynamic enough to adjust to the reality of a digitized classroom. 
Distance learning, Marco, I believe, um, uh, alluded to this when he said part of what the European Commission was wanting to do was to ensure that however educational institutions facilitate learning across boundaries, that this would be something that would be captured um, by the new exceptions and, and limitations. As you know, at Harvard Law School, we teach a global copyright class known as Copyright X. And one of the things that we do um, is that we find that we are often using all of the limitations and exceptions within the context of a digital online distance learning model. In the Copyright X system, um, students all over the world, this year we have close to 800, are taking classes in tandem with Harvard Law School students. They take an exam, just like Harvard Law School students. But what's the important thing about this is that we are seeing exceptions to the right of reproduction because of the things that we share across boundaries. We are seeing um, the need to utilize public display and, and public performance because when we are using case studies, we see this done um, around the world. We see time shifting and space shifting. Um, uh, we find um, that there are uh, needs, for example, to engage in the creation of derivative works as you are playing around and teaching about different possibilities using technology. So what am I saying? A digitized learning environment requires exceptions and limitations that are dynamic enough to satisfy the pedagogical needs of what is clearly going to be required as the classroom of the future. Um, so what is going to be the possibility? Um, remember that limitations and exceptions are often tied to specific uses. And as is the case in the European model, they're also tied to specific institutions. And as um, uh, Catherine has mentioned, educational institutions are now increasingly diverse. Educational uses are not singularly occurring within the confines of educational institutions as we know them today. At the same time, there's a dramatic increase in the use of digital content, and there is profound confusion and instability about what can be done, when can it be done, how can it be done. At the same time, copyright law is having to contend with privacy rights and licensing models that are now far more pervasive than when the Berne Convention's design was first put in place. And so this means that the European Union has provided a model, um, interestingly enough, that I advocated about 10 years ago um, at a conference in Berkeley. And in that lecture, I suggested three tiers of regulation, the regulation of institutions, the regulation of student-teacher interactions, and the regulation of the use of the content. The European model has adopted these three tiers of regulation. First, of course, by requiring that the use, the limitation and exception, be tied to an established educational facility. This is a fairly conservative approach, um, and it has been adopted within the confines of this um, regime. Second, by tying the limitation and exception to particular uses in the classroom, um, indirectly the regime is identifying teacher-student interaction as a legitimate site for the exercise of access to educational and copyrighted works. And then third, of course, <clears throat> regulating the use of that content. As I said in my lecture um, and in my paper on, on when we were celebrating at Berkeley those many years ago, the Statute of Anne, determining the necessity for a license is going to require quite some ingenuity to make sure that the rights that have been recognized at the EU level, in fact, have feet and hands at the local level. Second, we're going to need to think about locating the copyright owner and identifying um, what licensing intermediaries might also superimpose. Third, of course, is the ubiquitous problem of negotiating um, the license. So it's very important that limitations and exceptions do not become um, a lever for creating inequality 
amongst educational institutions. Not every country has well-funded educational institutions. Not every educational institution is going to be able to compete in the network of licenses that are made available. And of course, copyright owners of non-educational content that we want to use for educational purposes have little to no incentive to create. And the EU mechanism does not really address this growing problem. What this means is that we have taken a step in the right structural decision, mandatory exceptions to ensure that there's access to the public provision of education um, for all people across the globe. But it also means that we have introduced new dynamics that will require us to maintain vigilance around the structure and around the, the mechanisms of navigating access for educational and research purposes. Catherine has mentioned the importance of CC licenses. I think the modern classroom opens up possibilities for us to think about the EU model as a way of restructuring the importance of copyright law for education. I'll turn back now to Kavinia to um, lead us into the panel and to hopefully engage us in more specific and concrete questions about the use of the EU model as the, what I call an investment in a global copyright law of the future, responsible and dynamic enough to the needs of the global South and the global North. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Woods. It was uh, amazing as always, and I, I would not be able to resume your talk. So I'll move forward and, and straight forward to the panel. Um, this has been a, a really interesting to, to hear from all of you. And, and of course, one of our ideas for this panel was um, not only to discuss the EU exceptions as a model and and, and, and Professor Root uh, pointed out uh, 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 some of the strengths, but also some of the, the, the fragilities of this model if we think about the, the Global South. Uh, but, but, but before we go there, and I think most of you already touched on, on, on some of those, um, on, on, on of those limitations to use directly this as an entire model, um, or at least a model that would not need any adjustments. I think it's clear that we need some adjustments. But before we, we go there, and if we have time to go back to there, I would like to start by discussing <clears throat> this idea of mandatory exceptions regime um, in principle. So what are the merits, and if there are merits, of having a mandatory exceptions regime, like the one that we have now at European level, which is a minimum uh, mandatory set of exceptions, so it's a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, what is the merits of having this regime on a on a global scale? I mean, it's, it's very obvious for us on a regional scale what this has uh, uh, allowed us to do, especially when we think about cross border and joint activities. But let's think about this as a principle. And and I would like to to my first question to the panelists and whoever wants to to go first uh, would be, are there merits in having a mandatory regimes, uh, a mandatory exceptions regime at the global level? Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that since we introduced that in the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, I, I think it depends on, on what the particular copyrightable work is or what the domain is. Certainly in education, in, in the provision of public goods, such as education or scientific research, um, I think a mandatory um, exception um, immediately puts some stakes in the ground about what is a non-negotiable public interest. And so as a signaling mechanism, I think it's important. The challenge, of course, is, is mandatory um, means lots of different things. And so it becomes really important to think about the formulation of the mandate in, in, in the regime um, and what are the uh, 
scaffolding? What are the, the rules around what countries can and cannot do in that implementation process? It's very important, for example, uh, what the EU has done um, with limiting the capacity to license around um, these exceptions, that's crucial. Um, it's important to limit or to preserve the right to remove a technological measure that might be blocking access. Um, um, it's important to specify the conditions under which um, uh, you know, it's compensated or uncompensated because a mandatory exception that requires compensation may be just as bad as a non-mandatory or no exception at all. So it, this is, these are the challenges in constructing um, the regime that would make the most sense for the provision of a public good. I don't know if what anyone wants to to go on on this one, otherwise I will just bring another question. I don't know, Marco. I see you. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I cannot resist by uh, you know uh, commenting on that. Uh, I, I guess the question is, uh, uh, you know, what, what would be the merit to have a mandatory exception at international level, basically, uh, so not uh, not at the national level. But of course, I mean, many people uh, among you know that uh, you know we have. Uh, had this discussion, which is a difficult discussion in WIPO for, for many years. And uh, uh, I, 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 I have to say that the European Union has always been uh, quite reluctant, as you know, to have uh, uh, treaty language on exception. And, and I think that there is you know, one point, actually, which uh, I wanted to highlight to, to, to express, uh, let's say, the complexity of, uh, of this matter. And it is the fact that uh, usually the with the exception of the Marrakesh Treaty, which is a notable exception. But otherwise, uh, you know, all the international treaty on copyright uh, are uh, built upon the idea of national treatment. So it is not only a matter of uh, requiring uh, WIPO members uh, to introduce uh, certain rights uh, or exceptions uh, in uh, their legal frameworks, uh, but uh, usually, you know, the raison d'etre, I would say, of lawmaking uh, on copyright at international level is to have a national treatment mechanism. And uh, it is uh, not obvious to uh, apply the national treatment in the area of exception. I'm not saying that it is impossible, we have done it with Marrakesh, uh, but basically, you know, you bring in the discussion not only the requirement on uh, member states of WIPO to introduce exception at national level, but also, you know, cross-border exchanges uh, of uh, content which is uh, uh, protected basically by exceptions uh, uh, under national law. And this is a difficult uh, discussion. It's a difficult discussion technically because, uh, you know, the entire structure of international treaties uh, is usually, you know, not really in tune with the idea of having a national treatment of exception. So I would not even know exactly how this would work. It would be an interesting discussion, but it's also difficult and challenging from a practical point of view and from uh, uh, the, 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 the dimension of impact in the market, uh, because basically, you know, what, what I think we have said several times over the last years, uh, one thing is uh, having uh, mutual recognition within, you know, a rather limited, although for us very important space, like the European internal market or, you know, within a member states or within the United States and so on. Another thing is to imagine such system at a global level. So, I mean, I don't want to, to open a big discussion, but it was just to say that conceptually, I think that the challenge is not only and maybe not even much, you know, the mandatory aspect, basically, that uh, a, an international treaty may bring in, but rather, you know, how, you know, to deal with the fact that they usually international treaties are based on a national treatment approach. So if, if, I, if I may, Marco, so I think there, there's two different issues here, and, and I was asking specifically about mandatory exceptions, but but I think for the users' rights community, I think there's been two main calls. One, of course, is this one of trying to conceive a system that supports uh, 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 the development of uh, what Professor Root said, a, a copyright system that um, takes care of a non-negotiable 
public interest and 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 this would be having this framework that creates a minimum set of rights for these non-negotiable public interests everywhere in the world and another one which it's not necessarily uh, uh, linked to the to the mandatory exceptions would be to deal with the issues of cross-border uses so um, one thing is to try to solve everything and try to create a framework for for uh, for these uses uh, that is binding and mandatory and another thing is not enter into that uh, uh, level of effort of work uh, which we all know takes it will it would take a lot of time it's not impossible and hopefully one day we could we could get there but on a more um, priority level, I would say, is to solve the cross-border aspects uh, without solving, without dealing with national copyright exceptions. And, and I think this would be relevant not only for the entire world, but also for Europe. So in Europe, we have students. So the same, the same reasons that led the Commission to take care of um, online education within Europe, I think they apply elsewhere. So when we have students now attending programs, educational programs in Europe, but staying in their own countries, and especially the past two years, so in Singapore, in India, whatever, and we are not taking care of that of those uses that are really important for us as EU educational institutions, as EU teachers. Um, and, and I think there is an opportunity here without dealing with 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 the 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 probably the most problematic aspects of of, of this which are the, the 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 design of the exceptions would be to advance this cross border and i think there's several modalities to deal with this so you have uh bilateral agreements where at least between two countries you could have some recognition of a cross border effect but you could also have uh, an international treaty that deals with the applicable law to cross-border uses. So I, I, I'd like, you know, if you want to 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 uh, to to give your inputs on that, I would like to hear it. Uh, but I also would like to hear it from from other speakers. Sorry, Teresa. I don't know if you were referring to me at the end because I I received a phone call through the same computer and this uh, blocked your audio in the last five seconds. I'm really sorry yeah. for that. Go go ahead, Mark. I was just saying if you want to have to share your inputs on this on this idea of. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. The point I wanted to make was also really a technical point, which is, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the fact that, that uh, the current copyright treaties uh, always work with a combination of harmonization plus national treatment. And, and I'm not sure, you know, what the national treatment of exceptions would mean in practice. So the, this, let's say, was uh, the starting point of my reflection. And then, you know, I think you put on the table an interesting perspective, which is also, you know, what, what would be in the interest of uh, European public institution. Uh, and here is, is true that is a subject which uh, we have not explored much, actually, I must, I must say that that would be interesting to look at. Ruth, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> no. <laughs> Can I, can I maybe come in, um, Teresa, because I, I do think what you're raising is, you know, the pandemic has highlighted some of these challenges. And I do think that, you know, where we can reach consensus on education research, and that was the one place I think, Marco, maybe you want to comment on that as well, was where we, we were trying, we knew we had to do something. But it was also a challenge. And that's where I think when you're talking about the challenges between our international and our national interests and where there's some consensus is picking the areas and the domains where we could possibly be more closely working together and collaboratively and looking at where copyright mm -hmm. and public interest you know at the moment and that's why I mentioned climate because I do think there's something there about where we're trying to challenge the the world's most pressing problems and the barriers in terms of say research is still very very much there so um I do think it's a moving picture and I don't think we rest, you know, we look at what we've achieved and we look at where we're going, but but how we work more closely together 
internationally to address those pressing problems and seeing, seeing that through a copyright lens is something I still think we've got to work with policymakers and governments to look at how we can achieve that together. Okay, actually, I actually would love to hear your opinion on, on this subject of, of, of dealing with uh, uh, Professor Ruth, on the subject of dealing first with, uh, with cross borders or having some sort of, you know, using this model that you found of a legal fiction uh, for educational activities or having specifically an, an instrument on, a, on an applicable law. But, but yeah, if you, if you want to uh, give us our thoughts, I, I, I would love to hear it. So the, the cross-border issue is, is a, a really complex issue, frankly, because as we know, and I think as Marco has alluded, there, there are two tensions. First, you've got national treatment, which is um, now, you know, the, it's the, the, the law of the land. Um, and you have the GATT system, the WTO system. And I think one of the, I, I wasn't following closely Marco's work and the commission's work on, on, on this, on the DSM, but I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is that within the international economic system, um, regional exceptions look very different. So one way to think about this is um, if you're doing cross-border um, lending, um, or movement of, of materials, then you're looking really for a reciprocity. So if the EU has a mandatory exception and let's say SADC or CAFTA has a mandatory exception, then do they look the same way? Do they operate the same way? Because then of course that becomes your default, um, both because of harmonization and um, because um, hopefully member states have implemented it the same way. The challenge with copyright is that it is fundamentally a sovereign exercise. The reason we're having this conversation today is because we all understand that copyright has immense implications for the education of the public. It has immense implications for science and technology. It has immense implications for democracy. It has immense implications for privacy. And frankly, I think that what the, e, what the EU has done is step out into a minefield of untested um, doctrines, untested, um, uh, you know, uh, needs that the law simply internationally doesn't give us the guidance. Um, and so we actually have a lot of work to do in the implementation of this mandatory exception, even if it was just going to be within the EU. What does that mean for countries who don't have the exception, but who are wanting to do business with Italy? Um, I teach um, in different European institutions as a visiting professor. What does that look like? I'm teaching in Israel, you know, international copyright next week. What do I do with my materials? Um, what can I use? Um, and my IT folks are constantly saying, well, you can't put it on this server because we have fair use, but you can put it on that server um, because they do. I mean, so what's really important is the second level of regulation that I mentioned. And that is, do we want to be in the business of regulating what teachers do in the classroom? Because if the answer to that is no, then we need to think about what cross-border um, should look like when a teacher in a classroom says, I need to send um, materials uh, to someone in Johannesburg um, who is co-teaching or guest lecturing in my class, um, is that dissemination, is that sharing going to trigger an infringement lawsuit? So one of the possibilities, for example, is to create a safe harbor. I think we always go to limitations and exceptions, but could we have a safe harbor for education? Right? So we need to think about the cross-border implications because frankly, education is a cross-border endeavor. We are not interested in creating educated citizens in one part of the world and uneducated citizens in another part of the world. And education is global. We're creating and developing global leaders, global students. And so there's no question that the cross 
uh, sharing of materials is going to be the currency of the age. And we're going to need to be sure that the capacity for that is not hindered by copyright law. Um, and so in my view, the mandatoriness is not enough. It is a start. And we need to think about either a safe harbor um, or we need to think about um, some way of incorporating this into an international instrument that sets it as the global norm. Um, my, my take is we're going to need multiple things. The challenge with the approach we now have is in order for education to be done properly, we have to stack exceptions on top of one another. It's not enough to have a mandatory exception for education. I also have to have one for quotation. I also have to have one for derivative works. I also have to have one for public display and public performance before I do the thing in the classroom that I wanna do for my students. That's not sustainable if we're serious about providing high quality, consistent and sustainable access to education and to educational materials. Thank you. Uh, so one, I think it's, it's clear for everyone that um, this is a long road and, and, and requires uh, commitment and, and a lot of effort from, from, from and, and a willingness to, to, to discuss this and, and, and to negotiate and any, any modalities uh, of those that we have been discussing today. But one thing that comes to our mind is, uh, and, and I think uh, some of us believe that this could be a way of uh, starting the discussions without mandating anything. Uh, and, and I think there's always this attempt to talk about hard laws uh, because we know that only binding solutions can solve some of the problems uh, that we we've, have to deal with at the online and distance cross-border level. But one of the, um, one of the biggest um, uh, models that we have for, uh, for uh, uh, education exceptions is the Tunis model law developed in, in the 70s between UNESCO and WIPO, uh, which to this day is, is, is still being used. I mean, the wording of the Tunis model law is still being used by the Global South. So one of, one of the questions that we have uh, is if soft law solutions could somehow be a first step to start discussing these issues and to end up with a result that at least could support uh, the global south uh, and, and, and countries that don't have, as, as Ari mentioned, um, that have some difficulties in, in developing the, these exceptions for themselves. And maybe Ari, you want, you want to chip uh, on this one, um, what, if, if you have any thoughts on whether this would be a good idea for WIPO and for the standing committee to start by talking about a, a potential non-binding instrument on this area. Yeah. So maybe Ari, it's not, and if anyone wants to to go on and, and give your, your thoughts on whether a model law, a soft law, updating the Tunis model law to the technological yeah. environment. Okay, so if anyone wants to give a, a last thought on this, otherwise, uh, so maybe I'll ask uh, our speakers to give one, uh, uh, just wrapping up uh, and giving your last thoughts on, on whatever it can be on this question on any of the issues that we discussed uh, because we have passed uh, over our time already. So I'll start uh, with Marco, if you want to go ahead and give you give our last thoughts. Yes, I mean, uh, first of all, very quickly, again, to, to thank you for, uh, for having brought this discussion to the table because uh, I think, uh, as I said, it's a part of the copyright reform which we have not discussed very, very often and, uh, and it's good somehow to promote it and to, and to discuss it. Uh, uh, the second thing on, uh, you know, all uh, the forward-looking international issues, uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, what would be important uh, is uh, to basically go, go back to evidence and try really to have a discussion also on the basis of uh, specific difficulties, uh, specific needs, uh, specific situations. Uh, and in this context, I must say that, of course, we have not discussed it today, but uh, we have tried uh, in, in uh, the copyright reform in Europe to, as I said, uh, to find a balance between uh, 
the market and uh, the exceptions, the licenses and the exceptions. Uh, and I think unavoidably, you know, any discussion at international level would also need to, to look at uh, the balance between, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the exceptions, but also what, uh, what, what is the market situation in different parts of the world. Uh, and in this respect, I admit that probably, you know, in Europe and maybe in, uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, you know, uh, there is more that comes uh, through licenses and through the market than in other areas of the world. But it's not, it's not obvious to find a one-size-fits-all solution also because of uh, this different situation when it comes to the market impact that uh, an initiative on exceptions uh, of whatever kind, legislative or non-legislative, may have uh, uh, in different parts of the world. But to be seen and to be discussed further, of course. I don't know if... Um, I, I hope you could hear me because at some point... Uh, we, could, we could, Marco, I think. Okay. We will try now to to, uh, to listen Harry from last time, but I'm not sure he can he can come online. Let's see. Um, Teresa, since I have to go teach, speaking of education, um, I will just <laughs> say ahead, my Ruth. concluding remark, and yeah. I may have to drop off before you officially wrap up. Let me just say thank you, like Marco. This was wonderful to be a part of this event, and thank you to Communia. Creative Commons, obviously, where I sit on the board. Um, you are championing, I think, what is really one of the most significant um, issues to address inequality and to address um, democracy, and that is education and the role of copyright in facilitating or hindering education. I think there are three things that we need to think about as we go forward. Um, the implementation problems that Marco and I both highlighted. Um, and at WIPO, I, we have a burn appendix that is part of the TRIPS uh, agreement that is already part of the international system. It needs to be upgraded. It is already part of the law. And so um, thinking about access from that perspective of education, particularly for science in the global south is huge. If you were to combine that, um, which is already evidence-based um, with um, some of the provisions of the Tunis model law, and some of the norms that are clearly converging um, around cross-border uses of copyrightable material, I think you could come up with a fairly important and incisive, not broad, but incisive instrument that would further um, advance the vision of the Berne Convention and the vision of member states, the copyright be an important tool to build our democracies and to build the possibility for economic growth and human development. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Ruth, and, and uh, have, a, have a nice lecture. And thank you so much for uh, standing with us despite the uh, uh, overrunning uh, of our um, dedicated time for this. So, Catherine, please let us know your, your last thoughts on these issues. Uh, well, following from Ruth and Marco, I think that the discussion has to continue because we've got so much still to do. And I think that um, the ideas that we've talked about today and how we work more closely together um, and draw that consensus, because education, as Ruth has said, is pivotal to our democracy, it's pivotal to humanity, and it's pivotal in, the, in, the equal, in, in dealing and addressing the inequalities that are in our world today. And so I think that anything we can do at a global level to address these issues is vitally important. And the learning from the European Union's model will help us as we move forward. So I look forward to more debates and discussions, for hopefully hosted by Comunia and Wikimedia Deutschland too. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And thank you for to our panelists and, and our audience. I would like to call Eustus just to, to say goodbye to everyone. Um, if you want to come to the floor, I would be, oh, nice to see you, Eustus. <laughs> so, this is um, Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much, Eustus, and, and, and uh, our audience uh, and, and our panelists. I think uh, we have heard this was a first attempt to start discussing these issues. Uh, I, I, I definitely think we need a follow-up event, um, and uh, uh, we'll keep you posted on that.
Yes, definitely. I think that that would be uh, most excellent to, to hear more thoughts on this or related issues and, and have more events like this. Uh, I don't want to take any more of your time, but thank you again very much to the audience. Thank you very much to the panelists. Um, yeah, who have been very um, generous with their time. And uh, I think there's a lot to think about. So um, uh, let's, let's end this here and see yeah. you next time. Bye bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you.